Let's dive into the world of tabletop gaming and painting with the TippyCast. From rolling dice to mastering brushstrokes, we're here to fuel your passion. Join us for insights, inspiration and endless creativity. I'm Daz. And I'm Chris. So Daz, what's on the table? Well Chris, um, what's on the table for me today? Um, I've had a little bit of actually a little bit more time than I do normally. Uh, I've been off work for a couple of days. Uh, I've actually been able to get quite a bit done. Uh, fully finished off the uh, mutant martial artists. Um, I've had something on my shelf for a very long time that I've nearly finished and I just needed to put decals on it was some uh, warlord games um bolt action raw marine commandos um have they do you know what they've been painted for such a long time but I just haven't put the decals on them like the water transfers just because it's such a tedious job and I thought to myself the other day you know what I'll bite the bullet and I'll just get it out of the way um they've been up there for a while so much in fact that before i could even do the water slides i had to dust them i had to give them a quick <laughs> i had to get a, a brush and sort of dust them off that's how long they've been up there um putting some more colors on my uh half tilt craggy bottom goats that's currently my ongoing thing um and also i rearranged my paint in space i know that's not such much on the table but it's table adjacent uh and i feel it's made it a little bit more surrounding the table surrounding the table um yeah just say getting some more colors down uh i've nearly finished very nearly finished brutus headstrong and tashir marbler uh just weapons on them actually to uh, to do um i'm not gonna base them all until i've painted them all so i'm just gonna base them in like one one hit um got some ideas because obviously i'm thinking they're goats a bit more rocky i might i've got some like cork sort of boulder things that i bought ages ago so i might use those to make a little bit more rocky a bit more goat ish like goat yeah. goatesque um yeah that's what i'm on to do with my ones i kind of have it's all like a similar sort of vibe between them so you've got like your uh, like your worn strip in the middle, mm. but each team's got its own sort of twist on it. So, like I did in the video uh, for how to do the the half tilt bases, I've done one with where it's kind of like the ground's a bit darker, the grass is darker, a little bit more the like, dead grass, and then it's got the the, the gravestones mm. in it. So that's for the like the Eternal Legion stuff, but it's still. If you if you could put that next to one of the like the chivalrous knights, it would line up yeah just as well. Which I think so is good. I, I think kind of want to do that with uh, with the others. I mean, obviously the Oasis Sapphire Oasis. You know what they are? Sapphire Oasis, the ones on camels. Uh, yes. Yeah. I mean, obviously they're just going to be sand because you know the camels. Yeah. You know. Yeah, I think with them, I'm going to have like a little built-up bit of sand around the outsides where the, the grass would be, and then just the like the level sand there in the middle. That would look nice. Um, but other than that, because obviously I've, got a, I've had a dragon that I've been painting little bits of every so often. A lot of it's just like when I get... The colours, it's, like, it's a bit... That's the TD Combat Dragon, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I'll show you. I'll sort of. I mean, obviously people can't see what I'm showing you. But you can sort of see, like, the front of it is quite well painted and underneath. But as you can see, nice. like... That's blended. Um, where the paint's kind of running out. So as and when I do things with the same shade of red, I'll just... If I've got some left over, I'll just slap a bit more colour on. Um on that just again it's one of those things because it's not not really for anything other than itself it's not a priority piece for me to paint because i'm not using it for anything same as my uh mutant martial artists because they're not being used 
for anything, I've not really had any major incentive to paint them. But I'm trying to get me yeah. craggy bottom goats done because obviously now with the kids back at school. Um, the kids, the goats. <laughs> now with the kids back at school, I'm gonna. Um, I'm hopefully trying to get more game time with dad. So, mm-hmm. and I'm gonna try and get more. Uh, games in generally and I try and spread the good word of Half Tilt at my local gaming club uh, which would be good still trying to get a Rumble Slam off the ground with them but it's a hard sell this is a very this gaming club literally only either plays 40k Blood Bowl uh, Bolt Action and that's kind of Star Wars Legion? No it's not even like that so that's what I mean. It's quite a trying to get people away from forty k is hard. Um, yeah. And look, we we have this conversation quite a lot, but it's not the fact that we we don't dislike Games Workshop. It's just there are other games out there that we enjoy mm-hmm. more. And they don't have the same sort of business practice as Games Workshop do. Um, and and again, not to, not book heavy. Yeah, and not to take away from Games Workshop. You know, they make some fantastic minis. They've got a lot of fantastic designers. You know, but it's just, yeah, I'm not. I'm just not a fan of their business practice. But there's just other games out there that I enjoy more. That happen to be at a better price. You know. But, you know, we, we say that quite a lot. I just like to like add that as a caveat. It's not that we we don't yeah. like Games Workshop. We do. We... To be fair, I think a lot of the time I edit it out because we do mention it quite a bit. Mm. So I tend to cut it out of a couple of episodes. But, yeah, it's... it's uh... But what have you got on the table, Chris? Uh, I've been painting some green skin. Um, so often I paint an orc, but I've got the the food vendor crowd model from the Half Tilt Kickstarter. Nice. Uh, the orc fan. Uh, was he? Uh, was the orc fan who's got the arm with the yes the foam finger on yeah. it? Was he one of the Rumble Slam ones, or was he a Half Tilt one? Oh no, I think he was a Rumble Slam one. Well, oh, sorry. So was it was the skeleton flasher the foam hand was, must have been that one and the and the one with the woman with the sign the the uh, the dwarf woman yeah that's right dwarf that um, dwarf. yeah i've got the just dwarf um yeah so i've got those two and i've also got the the goblin board babe yes which my my friend america seth he's uh, he did a, a trade of some stuff and uh, he squares up with that, so I was like, and that's a like, that's I'm a hard thing. Excited to get that. That's a hard thing to come by. The yeah, she, the goblin board, babe. Yeah, because what was it? She was um, she never went to retail. No, she was uh, like a, a prize for tournament play. Yeah, like uh, shops running tournaments. Yeah. It, yeah, it never got released to retail, and the, and if you do find one, it tends to be on eBay, and it tends to be quite a bit, quite a bit. Yeah, there was her Mike Lavacle was a tough one to get until they re-released them, and the gra- um, the grave digger, the uh, badass grave digger. That is, I like that model. Bike, I guess. Mm. Yeah, that's really nice. I've got. Uh, uh, Seth Seth hooked us up with that one as well. But that it was a bit back when he uh, he hooked us up with that. Day it was uh, pretty sweet. So yeah, I've uh, I've, he also gave me an, uh, one of the original Mike Lavicles. So now nice. I've got two mics, one original, one recent uh, recent version. Yeah, I've got one of the um, but, the uh, versions. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, you are lucky enough to to get one of the the found ones that they uh, they dug out, in you? Yeah, being being friends with the owner has its perks. 
<laughs> it uh, it does have its perks. I don't say that often enough, but yeah, I'm quite I'm quite good friends with the guy who owns TT Combat. <laughs> What a guy! What a, he what is a guy. genuinely a really nice bloke. He, you could like if you met him, you wouldn't even know he was the owner. That's how much of a nice guy he is. <laughs> but um, owns a couple of yeah. breweries as well. Spoke of, spoke of a little bit on uh, on Facebook, but uh, never met the man. Yeah, he owns a couple of breweries as well. So I'm all. He's generally always keeps me with free beer. So nice. never going to moan about that. But, um, before we move into the main topic, yep. uh, what we were saying about Games Workshop and Warhammer and stuff like that, uh, that kind of lends itself to what to the, this episode's topic is, mm. where how if you are going to get into miniature wargaming, Warhammer's your, your gateway for that. If you are going to get into tabletop RPGs, Dungeons and Dragons is your, your gateway for that. Yep. And kind of the tilt we're taking on this one, uh, but I'll, I'll I'll let you introduce it. It's uh, it's your turn to introduce. Uh, yeah, as Chris was saying, um, generally speaking, when people think of a tabletop role playing game, their brain and it's and do you know what it is so in sort of so encrusted into nerd culture as a whole. Um, and when I say to someone, oh, you know, tabletop role-playing game, they will automatically go, oh, like Dungeons and Dragons. And it's, you know, when we, you know, any mm. miniature gamer out there is very much like a, oh, I paint little figures. And then the response you normally get from people outside of the hobby is, oh, like Warhammer. Because mm. that's the big main in-your-face brand, the gateway of us, yeah. of that hobby. That, that's the that's the game that's got a, a shot about it. You know, and so Dungeons and Dragons is the most media visible um, t- tabletop role playing game. Uh, a lot said could be said of that. You know, you look at any, you know, sitcom, TV series, TV shows, pretty much from now right up until what? Right until the 70s, right? Mm-hmm. Any nerd character that they had. You know, your typical, you know, sweaty, acne nerd with the glasses and the tape. <laughs> they played yeah, Dungeons uh, D20. <laughs> yeah, carried a D20 dice and played Dungeons and Dragons. And only only recently has Dungeons and Dragons as a whole become a little bit more, oh, excuse me, a little bit more cool, a little bit more accepted, a little bit more open, you know. And, and, yeah, and a lot of that you've got like Critical Role who did like major things. It's like people in the like, the voice acting community mm. playing their own D and D campaign or their own Pathfinder campaign originally, and then ended up creating a bunch of their own supplement books for D and D and a TV show on Amazon. And it's like. A lot of people, if they're going to start watching actual play D and D, it'll end up being critical role that they're watching. Mm. And also, as well, it Stranger Things has led. You know, when they played um, Dungeons Dragons and Stranger Things, it led to a big resurgence mm. of the table. Well, of the you know more acceptable vision of the um, t- TTRPG. It became a little well, bit. Well, there was more... even the. Uh, an official Wizards of the Coast Stranger Things D and D starter set. Yeah, it was in like the the red box, like the old, uh, the old D and D the big red book. Yeah, um, it's uh, got its own little campaign in there, and that's it. But we're talking about you know other games out, other tabletop RPGs outside. Of you know, outside of this, outside of the mm. obvious gateway to that hobby, because be on, I'll be honest. TTRPG is it's a hobby in itself, you know. I've I, you know especially been at the events. There's a lot of people there who are TTRPGers, heavily TTRPGers. 
and they'll buy and and you know what it does nicely fit in to what we are talking about because there are some TTRPGs that will get minis made of their character that they have you know they'll have this I mean, I've got a I've got a custom made one exactly uh, for the one of my old D&D characters you know, and then a lot of them will buy because a lot of the people that come to the TT stand sometimes are people just looking for scenery for their Dungeons and Dragons campaign because it's cheap, mm-hmm. affordable, accessible scenery. You know, and mm-hmm. that in itself becomes its own hobby. But again, we're sort of coming away from that, and uh, yeah, we're going to share a couple, a couple of games that we have each that you know we both have. Um, and we both, you know, well, I've played one of mine that I have. I haven't, I've yet to play the other one because it's a bit more niche, but we will get into that, um, first and we'll get into that. But first, Chris, would you, what would you like to start us off with? Uh, first one I want to talk about is Old Gods of Appalachia. Um, so it's based on a, like a, a podcast that's more of like a radio play. And I, I really recommend it. It's got such a good setting to it. So it's a like an eldritch horror, nine early nineteen hundreds. So like yeah, uh, like you die in West, because uh, um, like the coal mining industry boom in uh, the Appalachians and stuff like that. It's all mashed up into there, and it's like the. Obviously, as the title suggests, the old gods that have uh, that have been reawoken by all of this like industry that's taken place. So it's kind of fighting against the people in like creating these weird cryptids and creatures. And I love like cryptid and folklore stuff like that. And this just mashes all that together in such a good way. And uh, the like, like I was saying with the like the mining industry, the Appalachian region was massive for that. So this, the 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 story in the games and in the podcast, it all takes place around like, uh, like Virginia, West Virginia, Maryland, North and South Carolina, uh, Kentucky, and Pennsylvania. Just like that whole little belt mm. of uh, of area. And it like it plays on like the paranormal and strange goings on like real world stories. It's so, like you've got like the uh, the Kentucky goblins of like uh, like the past few decades and things like that, and it's adding this kind of weird twist to that in a like a early nineteen hundreds setting. And, I just, I mean, I, I love cryptids and things like that. And I was wanting to do a, like a D&D campaign about cryptid hunters. So I was coming up with rules for different cryptids. But then uh, I found out about the old Gods of Appalachia role-playing game. And I was like, I might just have to get that instead. <laughs> and uh, I mean, I need to, I need to get this on the, the table. It's just... It's a more recent one that's come out back to through Kickstarter, and uh, I've ended up with two rule books for it because I got a uh, the, the normal rule book, and then there was the like the signed deluxe edition for the Kickstarter that came as well, and it's got like a different dust cover on it. Uh, the like the sides of the the pages have been like um, the like golded or gilded, would it be, and just. The book itself is an absolute work of art. Uh, all the artwork inside of it is just fantastic. Just all the different characters, creatures, and stuff. There's just so much, like just beautiful design added into them. And absolutely love just going through the book in general. It's all like the like the folklore and stories about stuff, and it's it's everything I love put into there. But uh, as a game itself, uh, it's a D20 system, similar to your D&D stuff. Yeah. So if you want to go from that to, to this, 
it's quite an easy uh, quite an easy rule set to, to go from obviously yeah, your character sheet's got different names for stuff but like the, the idea uh, for how to play is, is going to be there um, much like with D&D your target score for tests uh, are that number up so if something's uh, like a, a 5 up you know, it's uh, it's quite an easy test. Um, your ability bonuses add to your rolled number, and uh, a roll of a natural one it gives a, a GM intrusion. So it could be the the player takes an extra point of damage if the roll was for a defense, um, or it could be uh, some sort of bad luck happens. Uh, the action's more complex than it first seemed. And a new feature is discovered of it. So it could be like, yeah, you're trying to get a lockbox open and you're, like, uh, you're picking, uh, picking the lock. It turns out it's been, there's like a magical ward that's been applied to it. So you need to find something else to kind of remove the ward before you're actually going to be able to get into it. And it makes it so it's not just about uh, like a critical fail or a fumble. But a, a storytelling device. Yeah. Um, a natural twenty gives you a, a major effect, which is like a like a big positive thing. Uh, you could halve the time it takes to perform something. So if you uh, if you like climb in a like a cliff face, you you do it in half the time. So it, gives, uh, it lets you set up the plan a little bit quicker, kind of get things worked out a bit easier. Uh, if you're in combat, it could deal extra effects to the attack, um, and it also deals an extra four damage. And four damage is what you like medium weapons. A lot of weapons end up being medium weapons: pickaxes, uh, some rifles, some pistols, uh, things like your characters would normally have. So you're essentially doing double damage there. Um, but unlike in D and D. If you get if you roll a natural 17, 18, or 19, you also get effects on them as well. Just they're not as big as rolling the 20, but the stake, yeah, it, it adds a little bit more importance of those high rolls. So um, 17 and 18, it deals a uh, bonus damage of 1 and 2. Uh, obviously, 17 does 1, 18 does 2. Uh, rolling the 19 grants a minor effect, which could be you cause a distraction that hinders the enemy's actions, or you can strike a specific part of the uh, the enemy. So that grants its own bonuses, and it could be it makes an escape easier if someone's being grappled, or if you target a weak spot of a creature and you deal a bit more damage there, and uh, you're dealing an additional 3 damage from the uh, from rolling the nineteen anyway, it's just like like I say, it makes those higher rolls a little bit more important again. Mm. It's yeah, which it's, obviously uh, I in the rule book there's uh, there's some campaigns, which uh, which are just nice little introductions into the the world of uh, the old gods of Appalachia, and it's so easy just to start creating your own. Uh, you run their little tales because things are based on like fairy tales and folklore and stuff like that. And just listening to the podcast gives you so many ideas of different types of character and like witches and things like that there to bring into it. It's just there is so much room to to move in the in the game. I mean, I've I does like the sound of that because obviously, uh, yeah, D and D's. I've always found one of the biggest sort of with the dice. Yeah, when you get a nat twenty, great, and then it's like, but six, mm. seventeen, eighteen, and nineteen, although generally are a success, it's not that meaningful, you know. Um, so yeah, it is nice that they would put some effect in like the rolls just before twenty, because I look at that as saying you're mm. sort of getting near to that critical success. Yeah. So that's nice that they did that. So I'm gonna so, have to give that a quick. Might have to listen to the old podcast and then go from there. But well, what I I really want to get this onto the table because with the the Kickstarter, the 
plastic. I've got a bunch of the the extra stuff with it. So it's like mm. thick tactile things. You've got like uh, like leather bound books for mm. like for the, the DM's handbook and uh, the characters have like just little like uh, like crib sheets with with stuff on. Just nice. nice things to have on the table for use. But there's also the uh, like the coins, mm. uh, some like just. Some pieces to, to use for for different things, just maybe tokens or whatever, and it's like a different script for the the companies that are in in the game, because there's a whole bunch of different currencies, so you can kind of they like, do what they were doing during that day, where different companies that own the town they would use a script rather than the money just to try and keep the people in the town, yeah. so they don't go off and. And try to do things so you can kind of have the T's of of dollars in the in like the the foreground of it, but they're getting paid in the scrip and the like they're, they're you know, you're, you're keeping them locked in that area in a, like in a natural way. Yeah, and I, I quite like the the idea of that, but I mean these coins like the the scrip coins and stuff they just they're nice to have at the table, like I said, like mm. really tactile, good quality, like metal on them and things like that. Uh, there's like cloth maps and like, nice. bits, different cards for like equipment and like creatures and initiative and things like that. It's just nice, just stuff to have at the table that makes sense for it to be there. Oh, definitely. Stuff like, like when you're playing online, you don't, you don't really get that immersion and just. That feeling of just mm. dealing cards out and stuff like that. I, I mean, I just, there's just something about, well, I mean, the tabletop role playing games. It's great to have them at a table with stuff like that. Oh, yeah, definitely. You, you, it's, a, it's a bit more of a. It, I find that when you are playing with other people physically with each other, there's a lot more of a. I, I find the immersion is better because, yeah, you're, you're all mm-hmm. bouncing off each other and you're all sort of feeling each other's energy while you're there which is yeah which it, is very and it different. becomes an event rather mm. than you just on a on a camera exactly um one of the games i'd like to talk about is a game called savage well so savage worlds is like a system it's a game sort of system there's lots of other subsects of savage worlds um mm-hmm. savage worlds is made by pinnacle entertainment um, and basically, it's more sort of steampunk, sci-fi, horror than D and D's just sort of like fantasy setting. Um, mm-hmm. And there's lots of different settings that they've got. Um, and basically, you got ones called Deadlands Reloaded, which is set in the West, well, in the Weird West. Um, the Tour of Darkness, Necropolis, and a World War Two setting they had that was called Weird Wars. Um, and basically, it's still a multiple, a polymorph. A, um, what's the word? Uh, it's a poly it's dice system. So it's different sort of dice. Different. Is that what it's called? Polymetric. Yeah, they're Poly- different polyhedral. Oh, that's it. Yeah, polyhedral dice set in, so obviously D20s, D4s, 6, 8, 10. Um, works the same principle as... So it's something recognisable to your, like your D&D yeah. players. Uh, that's like with, with old gods, you, you've got all those polys as well. Um, but basically, it's a... Con- so pinnacle, the difference between Pinnacle Games System and well, Savage Worlds as a whole over D and D is um, essentially they have a what's called a plot point campaign, um, and in such campaigns, a series of loosely defined um, adventure scenarios are presented. Uh, a main storyline is presented as a series of plot points, and additional side quests or savage tales, as they're referred to in the game. Uh, expand the scope of what's going on in the campaign and the format does allow a group of characters to explore the universe a bit more um you know play while paying through or completely disregarding the main storyline 
you know, so it kind of lends itself more to that. So it's not like a, a main focus. It's like, okay, look, this is what's going on, but there is also other stuff for you to do. So that's kind of when you create Savage World campaigns, it's not just, a, oh, here's what you got to do. And it's like, mm. Savage World is very much, here's the main plot point, but there are other ways, other things you can do. Um, but one of my favorite settings in Savage Worlds is I quite like Deadlands Reloaded. That's just purely because I'm a sucker for a Western. Um, and You really do love a Western. I do love a Western. Um, but there's a, a class in Deadlands Reloaded called a Huckster. So a Huckster is kind of like a magician, like a magic class. But his magic is very based on like playing cards. So different decks to different cards will do like different things. Um, and so, yeah, it's good to have that physical card deck of cards uh, and everything in Savage. So basically Deadlands works as like an expansion to other Savage worlds. Um, but if you're clever enough, you can, funnily enough, fit a lot of the rules that are in the Deadlands, like with revolvers, guns, into a and d setting. I'm not that fussed, but um, it's not too far removed. What if if you were going to do that, just play Savage Worlds, Deadlands Reloaded. Yeah. Uh, you still need yeah. the core. It's a book in itself, but you still need like the core Savage Worlds starter to play Deadlands because it just expands. Mm. It just gives a more yeah, different it's more set. Of a supplement to to it. It's like yeah, your expanded rules to build on the yeah the core book. But it's say it's set more in like a sort of steampunky sort of sci-fi horror sort of universe. Um, a lot of like sort of weird horror things to kill. Um, you know, it's not like you fact like you know oh it's, you know it's like little goblins and overgrown fairies, ogres, and no, it's like undead things, like <laughs> demonic things. <laughs> vampires <laughs> it's like things like things that go bump in the night sort of stuff um but again it is there's lots they, they have because savage worlds is like the main brand but there's so many expansions to it that sort of change the flavor of it um mm -hmm. and it is yeah, it's more of a it's say it's not so much focused on the main outcome or goal it's just like you're presented with it but that's completely your choice and, and the gm won't try and steer you back onto that course he'll just if you want to carry on playing to do with the other bits around knocking about whatever you know that's because it's not yeah. what it's about if you want to do like these savage tales great that's what you want to do fine yeah <laughs> it's not you may not be the guy that goes and kills the vampire lord you're the guy that clears the mine out of the uh the the, the vampires familiars and things like that just being like a glorified uh glorified bin man but if that's how you want to play your game, play your game. Someone's got to do it. I just, just a little bit off topic. It's just similar to this because I've always thought it'd be funny if there was like an RPG game that's set within another universe. Let's take the D&D universe as a prime example. But you're not playing like a hero character. You're just kind of playing like an everyday dude. Like you're just sort <laughs> of, you're just role playing that life while these adventurers are going off and doing like these like uh, like oh i'm playing oh i'm a level i'm a level four uh potions shop owner you know and it's like <laughs> and you and you're trying to like not let the heroes like get a barter skill on you so that like, you still try and make money off them and they can't you're still doing the opposite of what whatever they're doing all all of those bandits on the road have been uh have been killed so Someone's like, got to pick them up. Items are easier to get a hold of, yeah. which is knock the price down of everything in your shop so you're not making as much money. So you've they've got to try and pay people off to become bandits. Exactly. <laughs> and just, I mean, you're, if anything, so you're just trying to sort of survive in a world around the heroes. And I just think that would be mm -hmm. quite funny as a concept of a, of a role-playing game. It's just sort of like you're role-playing just, just trying to survive in the, in the economy of a fantasy hit set in like D and D. Oh, there's an orcish horde coming. Oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Oh, I'm going to roll to try and pack <laughs> you're the, up. You're the town's undertaker. And the uh, the yeah. heroes have just walked into town. It's like, here we go. Let's get some coffins made. <laughs> I, I roll a persuasion check to try and convince them that that's always been the price. <laughs> 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 and I haven't just and I haven't just painted over the sign. <laughs> Things like I just I don't know I just think that's that'd be quite. Fresh, that's not fresh paint. Yeah. But don't touch it. Don't touch it. It's wet, wet, wet paint. Yeah, I just I don't know. I just think it'd be really funny. <laughs> it's permanently wet paint. <laughs> yeah, like I'd say, like you just you're just playing like an ordinary townsfolk, but you're just trying to make a living, and it's just sort of like, and you've got to occasionally deal with heroes. <laughs> it's like. <laughs> I just think that'd be quite funny. So instead of like the DM playing the townsfolk, he's now having to play the heroes, and you're the townsfolk. I just think that'd be quite a, a fun little twist on D and D, or like any <laughs> game where you just play. There should be, if anything, every D and D game that requires like townsfolk or whatever like that. There should be a rule set where they play as the townsfolk in the. Game. I don't know. <laughs> I just think that'd be quite funny. That would be fun. Oh, what, what are you? What are you and your? What are you and your party going to do? Well, we're going to go to a, a former town meet. We're going to call a town meeting. <laughs> talk <laughs> to talk about the uh, rat infestation that's happening and what we're going to do about it. <laughs> Why isn't the mayor doing something about <laughs> this? <laughs> the meter is full of rats. <laughs> you can't expect us to drink from there. Well, we could we could hire a hero. Oh, I see. We'll just hire some adventuring heroes to come and deal with our rats. <laughs> oh, oh, adventurers coming over here, taking jobs away from our pest control people. <laughs> Poor old Mick. <laughs> Poor old Mick. It's, he's struggling to feed a family of five. <laughs> Mickey Warnom, because he lost one arm to the plague. <laughs> Trying to feed his family, and you're taking his job away by say, paying off some some heroes. What, what would you pay them? Ten gold? That's three times as much as what Mickey charges. Exactly. <laughs> but uh, where's, where's all this gold coming from, Mr. Mayor? Yeah, I, I, so if anyone does play uh, any sort of tabletop role-playing games and thinks this could be a good idea, feel free to write something <laughs> up cause, and then let us know because I just do think that would be quite hilarious. Like Nothing like... Oh... <laughs> I could that, that way I can live out my 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 dreams of you know economic stability, <laughs> and not having to worry. Yeah, I just like I just like the idea of the the, the guy that sells portions. His uh, his stock has just lost all value because products are easy, like are able to get through to the town easy. So he pays people off to become bandits. <laughs> and again, that you could do that. You could be a dodgy businessman. He he becomes. He becomes the villain. <laughs> yeah, like one of you accidentally. The heroes that. Yeah, you in, the, uh, in your the next, uh, your next game, the hero, like you, you're back to playing the heroes, and you've got to find out who's paying all of these, uh, all of these bandits that keep reappearing. <laughs> you find out, yeah, it's the potion <laughs> vendor because it's the economy is <laughs> the economy's become too like not good enough. <laughs> There's no supply and demand you nearly anymore. Nearly tanked his business. <laughs> You tanked his business. I, I, he's he's took a hit out on you because you you nearly destroyed his livelihood. Just acts, just acts. That's the, that's the that's the thing people playing DD don't realize. Everything that your heroes do have a massive impact on every business that's in that town. Yeah, and well, especially when they're like you know. You're like another thing as well. Like I say, if you're a shop owner, like you have to sort of check your inventory at the end of the day. And after having adventurers come by, and then you've realised they've nicked something. Now you've got to do something about it. Yeah. Yeah. This is why I don't think we should allow adventurers <laughs> into the town. You can't trust them. <laughs> old old Robbie the racist. <laughs> he doesn't like adventurers. He doesn't like don't like outsiders. Does Robbie? <laughs> Do, doesn't like what's that? Travelers, <laughs> <laughs> Rob, Yeah, Robbie. You the... think that these travelers are stealing things from your shop? Old, uh, old Zena the xenophobe. <laughs> doesn't like outsiders. <laughs> <laughs> old, don't don't mind him. That's just xenophobe. That's just xenophobe over there. <laughs> doesn't like outsiders. He he doesn't trust you lot. Doesn't trust you people. That's. <laughs> 
<laughs> if we can keep it on Xenos for a second, I'd like to uh, introduce my second game. That was fluid. Which is the, uh, the Alien RPG by uh, Free League. Uh, it's a D6 based system in the obviously in the Alien universe uh, films. Um, it's a whole bunch of supplement books that give you more options for character building. So currently, there's a, a core book which gives you the rules for char- uh, creating characters based around like a ship's crew, um, like a, a kid, a corporate officer, and colonial marines. Um, then you've got a, a colonial marine book which has a like a, a bit of a campaign in there as well but expanded rules for creating colonial marines uh, allows you to like choose specializations for different types of marines so you can go for like uh, your snipers and medics and uh, smart gun carrying heavy weapons experts so that you can like if you're doing that and going through that campaign all of you are colonial marines, and that you you that you build up your squad basically through that. So you, you cover a lot of different things. It brings in new weapons to use, a uh, bunch of new vehicles because obviously the colonial marines have a different set of vehicles to what your uh, like your space truck as I've got, and uh, it it's cool. It kind of blends things, particularly in the colonial marines one. Uh, blends things from the the films, the games, and the the old Kenna toy line from the nineties. Uh, there was like one of the I was reading an interview with uh, the the guy who wrote it, Gasca. Um, he he said like he he was looking at things like the the old toys and how would they fit in a like basically in that universe of things so there's uh, there's a vehicle that was like one of the, the the colonial marine jeeps basically and kind of redesigned that slightly to, to have more of a like um an aesthetic that fits the the, the films mm. and like do, does a really good job of, uh, of bringing that in and it's like one of those things where if you if you're from a particular era like me and my and my brothers who had the toys, you you see the picture of it and it's like I recognise that. That is that's that toy. It's even got the uh, like the no bugs graffiti on it, and I I love that. Um, there's a what's the other one? There's also the uh, supplement book for creating more. Like, uh, like colonist based things so there's like corporate characters uh, entertainers like owners of uh, like clubs and stuff like that and uh, gives you more background framework for creating settlements in your games um this because there's two types of a campaign you've got your your standard campaign which is you create your characters you set out on these uh, these missions and things and um, the books tell you if you you're doing a campaign like that, you use the xenomorph, uh, xenomorph a bit more sparingly to keep that horror aspect of them. Uh, where there's plenty of other threats in the universe, so you've got like uh, other creatures like uh, like uh, colonial marine bug hunts and things like that, where it's not just all about xenomorphs. There's there's other creatures on these planets that you're colonizing. Um, power struggles between different groups so you've got the union of progressive peoples like uh, space commies uh, the three world empire and the united americas so it's like the three big power groups on earth who have kind of split sections of space up between them so you end up having like skirmishes going across the the lines on them um and then you've got your corporate sabotaging and because the the books give you so many different uh, like companies within the world of the of the alien like franchise, so you've got the things like Seeks and uh, Hyperdyne, uh, very different from Cyberdyne. Although James Cameron did create it as a nod. Uh, obviously, you've got like your Whale and Jutani's and things like that. So it's like uh, your ongoing campaigns kind of lean into a bit more of that. But then you've got the cinematic campaigns, which are a lot more brutal, uh, very xenomorph heavy. 
you it tells you don't expect the character to make it to the very end because you're basically playing out the film. So different characters are going to die because the, the Xenomorphs hit very hard and they're very unforgiving. It's just incredible. But then once it tends to be your pre-generated characters, um, the very narrative storyline still got room to, to move, but it's a little bit more focused than mm. uh, than a standard campaign. And I mean, the good way for just picking up the rules because it's it's like a tailored adventure for that. And across the the books and there's big uh, supplements for just these cinematic campaigns. There's like an overarching plot uh, from all of them. So if you went through, played them all in the release order, you end up getting a really nice story that, in the end all these like loose threads start to come together and you see where things were going from uh, from earlier ones it's like really really well planned out the uh, storyline yeah, just looking through the book you you're like, reading through like through the campaigns for when you're DMing and you just see it all coming together and it's fantastic uh, the amount of law again I absolutely adore law uh, I will just inhale all of that. Uh, so much in these alien books, and I just, I just love it. I cannot get enough of the alien stuff. I mean, I have sort of dab. I've not dabbled, but I've seen it being played, and I've a lot of people who, if again, it's one of those things that if like if you're super into that franchise, it's a great, great thing. I mean, even yeah. if you are like a casual fan of the Alien series, it's still a great play. Still a great game because it's well. Free League, Free League used this engine for a bunch of different games. Um, they say it's a D six based one. You've got your your dice that you'll roll for different tests, but as your character start building up stress, you get more dice to roll. So you'd want like you with these stress dice, you want to have a different colored dice for them, and if. Uh, you've got more chance of rolling your six, which is a a successful roll. But on these stress dice, if you roll a one, that's when you start getting more complications. It adds more stress. You get more dice to roll, more chance of getting stress, but more chance of succeeding. But that stress will kill you. You can only get so much stress before you got, like your characters, their heart just packs in because of the amount of stress. And I I think that's a really good mechanic. It's It's another one that got brought into the Walking Dead uh, the Walking Dead RPG, mm. um, same sort of idea of the the the, the threat dice, the stress dice, uh, bringing that in, and I think that's a really nice mechanic. It's a way, it's a way of giving your players more dice to roll and make things more successful. It gives it that risk reward factor of doing things. I also think as well, it gives and gives the characters like a bit more that. of a humanity. You know, like mm. you look at like other RPG games where you play as like a hero archetype sort of thing there comes a point where you end up so any sort of hero that you tend to have in like these games is obviously just a bet you know better than like the average knocker ever uh, an average person knocking about and then that then does get to a point when you sort of get to those higher levels where you are essentially just a walking apocalypse um yeah you know, so but it doesn't have give a lot of humanity to those characters. But say giving them like having that stress in a game like that, and obviously we've all we've seen the films. Anyone who's seen the films know that you're gonna be like you've got a giant alien chasing you. You're gonna get pretty stressed. And yeah. yeah, bringing that in, and it... especially when you know how how many instant kill attacks they've got in this game, that is very stressful. <laughs> exactly, you know, and it's, and I think that's good. It does add a level of humanity uh, to it. Mm-hmm. But on a on a little bit more of a light hearted approach, now <laughs> take it taking a nice little <laughs> turn on a light hearted approach. Now, like Chris. I do enjoy quite a lot of lore in games and I'm a massive, massive nerd of the Avatar 
uh, Last Airbender universe. Or Legend of Arm. So we're not going from James Cameron to James Cameron. No. It's a completely different avatar. <laughs> different avatar. Um, obviously the old uh, Nickelodeon. The real avatar. The real avatar. Like, don't don't come out. I will fight you. Like, now I'm not talking about the M. Night Shyamalan dumpster fire film. I'm not talking about that. Because any true fan of the franchise, it's like Mad Max Beyond the Thunderdome. We just don't talk about it. Um, <laughs> I years ago, um, I backed a Kickstarter from a company called Magpie Games, and they do a tabletop RPG called Avatar Legends. Um, this is now currently available on retail. Um, I backed it on a Kickstarter because, again, I saw it and I was like. This is all of my greatest dreams come true. I get to pretend to be some sort of like elemental bender. Um, that's not me saying anything else other than that. It's if you are a fan of the franchise, you'll understand what I'm talking about. Um, for anyone who doesn't understand... <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm just going to big smile on my face there. <laughs> so for anyone who doesn't understand the Avatar universe, uh, it's set in a mythical land... That isn't too dissimilar to um, Asia. It's a little bit of a mix-up. Uh, and there's four nations. You have got the Water Tribe, the Fire Nation, the Earth Kingdom, and the Air Nomads. So they all control, are able to, certain members of those cultures are able to control that element. And these are referred to as benders. Water benders control water, fire benders, fire X, Y, Z. But the Avatar is the only person in the world who is able to control all four. He can mass bend all four elements. And he is solely designed to keep the peace in the world. He's there to keep balance between the four kingdoms. Um, mm. But in the Legend of Aang, the Avatar disappears and then the Fire Nation try to kill off the next avatar before he's born um, because the avatar goes in cycles they take an app it takes a member of each tribe it goes in a cycle it's a whole big thing um anyway not to get too i could talk to talk about that for hours um and the way the game plays it's a d6 system but it's also um there's a system in it that's basically called uh balance so it's a balance system so when you're an earthbender or an airbender or a waterbender or a firebender, being able to control that element and do things with that element require for you to be at balance with yourself. And think of balance is also about, it's in a lesser of a term, advantage or disadvantage. So if you have certain abilities require you to be within a certain bracket of balance... So if you're trying to do something like a move that's more particularly aggressive, you need to sort of be a bit more on the aggressive side of this rather than a peaceful side. Um, but if you go too far either way, you lose control of what you're doing. And it will have consequences for what's happening. So if you lose control, you can end up hurting yourself, um, inadvertently hurting an NPC, hurting another member of your party. Um, by just losing control. So there's ways of regaining that balance um, throughout the game. And it's more of a play-to-find-out kind of game, rather than, again, there being like a set structure of what's going on. So mm -hmm. the DMs of these games, it's kind of a lot more of it's kind of done on the fly. He'll have like a rough structure of what's going on and rough ways to keep the story going in a correct direction. But it's, you do things, and if it fails or it succeeds, it's like, well, we'll just find out what happens, you know, in one way or another. You know, and it's like, oh, okay, let's say you were trying to get on an airship, you know, but you don't. And it's like, oh, okay, well, that was quite a key point in the story. So now we're going to have to find out 
how are you going to sort it out from now? You know, but what's great about the core set of the uh, Avatar Legends set, um, the main core rule book, it's about, I'd say, a good inch and a half thick. Um, and a lot of it's like lore because there's different periods. So mm -hmm. you have different eras. So they refer to the eras of time periods as when certain avatars were alive. Right. Uh, so you have like the Kyoshi era, the, um, but so you've got the Ang era, the Kyoshi era, the Ang era. There's also a big gap in this because of how the story works. So Ang mm. was meant to be the next avatar after um, Roku, Avatar Roku. Um, he went missing for a hundred years. So there's a gap in that story called the Hundred Years War, where there wasn't an avatar. Mm. So in the book, it explains all of these sort of time periods, and you can play uh, in those time periods. Um, See so if you want to play in the Kyoshi era or the Roku era or the Ang era or within that Hundred Years War. Um, and there's also the Korra era, which obviously there's the Legend of Korra, which was the Avatar. Yeah, I was thinking it was Korra one of the Avatars. Yeah, so she was the Avatar after Aang. Um, and obviously during certain... So in the Hundred Years War, you couldn't play... You could play as an air nomad, but you'd have to sort of explain it really narratively. Because obviously during that mm -hmm. time, all of the air nomads were killed. Like they were just exterminated mm -hmm. to stop the next avatar being born. Um, point being is, you can play as an avatar, but it's kind of unfair because on the other people that you play with. If you're playing as a party... Mm -hmm. It's kind of unfair for you to play as an avatar and they can't. And it's like, you're just effectively a god in this world. But again, you know, it still has all of that, you know, lawful, chaotic, good, bad. You play your character how you want to play your character. And, and they can just have these abilities. But if you choose, like, you don't want to be... A elemental bender in this game you can be a swordsman or like a weapons user um, or in the later versions you can be more of a um, a tech based person like you, you become more tech based because obviously it's kind of set in like a not so much pre it's not it's just kind of like pre electricity area so when you start getting into those so it's a lot very like steam powered yeah so basically uh, uh... Yeah, it's any sort of machinery is either steam powered or is kind of powered by the element that it is. So a prime example of this is the Earth Kingdom um, have a mail delivery system like which they have. And it works by using earth bending to send things up and gravity brings it back down. So you'll just have guys throwing like stone carts up hills and then gravity will just bring it back down in a slide you know <laughs> uh the fire nation will use a lot of steam powered because obviously they can create fire yeah they can heat the water up and create yeah. the steam you know the air nomads would just use air but air nomads are kind of like more like monks so they can lived a very basic lifestyle and kept themselves to themselves and the water tribe are very much like native american native indians or like Inuits, so they kind of live like that. And they only live on the north and the south pole of this land. But the point of the game is, as I said, it's just you can play in any of these areas. There's set stories. Um, you know, there's some pre-written characters already in the back of the book where you can make your own. Um, and yeah, it's if you're a big, big fan of the universe of that, it is a really, really fun game to play. And when I backed it um from the kickstarter i got a lot of physical stuff like i got like a nice cloth map which i've got in a frame uh, on my stairs nice. i got a pie show type tile pie show is a game in the universe 
Um, I've got the spe special dice, the um, a dice for each element. I've got a dice set for each element. Oh, cool. They're nice. The D6 system, it's like you roll two D6s, and that's, that's your score. Um, and then you take balance into effect. Mm. I've got action cards which show the action of what you're trying to do. Like, oh, if you're trying to do like a flame kick, like it will show you the action on this card, and it's mm -hmm. and you can if and you can act it out as well, uh, and that's part of the game as well. If you want to, that you can act it out, and to give you more of an advantage to do it if you can act it out. So it, it's a <laughs> lot more involved as well. So it's not like you go, oh, I'm going to do this, and it's like okay. But if you sort of show yourself doing it, you know the DM, the GM, the games That's master will give you a give you a, like a bonus for doing it. But um, yeah, it's like um, like really getting into your role play. Yeah, uh, like rewarding that. But um, yeah, it is. Again, it's one of those things. It's quite a niche thing. It's if you know, I mean, if you know about the Avatar or like the Last Airbender stuff like that. You know, it is. A, it's it's done a real good service to the fans. It's probably one of the best sort of non, one of the best sort of representations as a game. You know, digital or not, representations as a service to the fans. It's like everything else, mm. like the video game that they brought out, was just terrible. <laughs> you know. But as a tabletop role-playing game goes, uh, especially for something so niche as that, it's not like a generalised thing where it's like, oh, you know, everyone knows what elves and orcs and stuff are. You know, this is the universe where it's like, you have to know what it is for you to understand anything yeah. that's going on. It's like a proper game for the fans. It's yeah. not just the, the come along and roll some dice sort of thing. But I mean, to, truth be told, I did explain this game to someone who's never play heard of it he'd sort of the only thing he'd sort of not seen is like i think he saw like a couple clips of the m night Shyamalan film and sort of understood roughly what it was um but then he played the game and he was like oh and i was like dude just watch the animated series and he, yeah he did and he became a massive fan because of the game so it kind of went the other way um but yeah, it is one of those things that is you have to kind of be a fan of it. Much like the Alien um, RPG game, you have to be a fan mm. of the franchise to like really enjoy it. But it's still a yeah. very solid and fun game to play because it's quite lighthearted. You know, although the game Avatar Legends can tackle more serious topics, it's still quite lighthearted. You know, it's like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's just it is. Yeah, it's a very simple game to play. It's so it's not even that difficult. I said, but again, a lot more of it's based on you do kind of have to know what's going on in the world. Yeah, yeah it's like it, it's a very. I'm guessing it's a very like stripped back rule set that just gives you like all the rope you need and. You just you're exploring the world, and that's where the game really comes into its own. Yeah. As, you, as you're going about that, and that's it. And I think that's what it's more about. It's rather than it leans more on the world and the lore of the world. Um, and yeah, there's combat, and there's you know things that you need to puzzles you need to solve, like any role playing game, and there is role playing to mm -hmm. be done. Um. But yeah, it's it is it doesn't so much focus on that. It's more about enjoying the journey rather than the actual destination of what you're trying to get to, which I do quite mm. enjoy. Which is a bit more relaxed, I want to say, but it's still very enjoyable. But yeah, even again, the books, the art style, and it's great. Um, they actually managed to get one of the original. Uh, art designers for the TV series, the cartoon series they had, to do some of the artwork in the book. So, yeah, cool. uh, but the book has got so much lore. Very here. good, good coherent style between mm. the, between both of them. Yeah, but other than that, I think we've you know 
bored you enough with hopefully giving you a bit of a taste of other TTRPG games that you might want to go out there and explore. Uh, maybe you'll even find something that we, you know, that you, re- you know, like a, maybe a super niche thing that you're into. Um, and so just, you know, let always remember there's just because it's the main thing that everyone knows about doesn't mean it's the only thing. Yeah, I think we've got a, a good a good thing. I mean, uh, both of mine were quite horror related because I love horror stuff. But like Old Gods, it's very like uh, like folklore and like I say, cryptid based. So like people love that. This that's perfect for them. Savage Worlds, you are saying you've got like your base rule set. And then you've got all of these extra levels of it, mm. like your uh, your weird war, the your your western stuff. There's like different things you can hit there. Very different storytelling between a world war story and uh, a cowboy story, mm. especially when you're adding vampires into it. So, like you you can hit different uh, like different interests with that alien. <laughs> Is if you just want a, a, an awesome horror, you've got it right there. If you want like your uh, some more like, I mean, you could you could basically do a spy story within it, the alien universe doing corporate espionage. You've got a whole lot of stuff, or you could have just going all out future war, mm. colonial marines. That's right there. You want to know what the uh, the bug hunts that the colonial marines mention in like a, just like a throwaway line in Aliens? You can you can go on that mission, and then you've got Avatar Legends where you you go and again it's something that's very like folklorey mm. uh, with a like a big established like universe that it's in an established like uh, history to that yeah. world. And you can enter into that, and there's there's plenty of different stuff, and that's just like a few of the examples we've given. There's so many other types. Mm. I mean, we've got the Fallout RPG, Monster of the Week, Paranoia, Hellboy, Hellboy. I mean, you mentioned uh, the, the Walking, Walking Dead. Yeah. Oh, good lord! There's just there is so much out there, um, and it's just. I mean, the thing as well. There's even an Assassin's Creed one. I think if it's a thing, like a like a big media thing, whether it be a video, I'm pretty confident there's even a Resident mm. Evil one. I wouldn't even be surprised if there was. I, I wouldn't be surprised if there was. <coughs> and if there isn't, just take those Walking Dead rules. Yeah. Create Resident Evil with it. Just a reskin. Do it. There's there's some for everyone, and the, the, there's even a Ghostbusters one. You'd be hard pressed to find it, because it's a it's an old one. But I... it, it also mentions my town. Anik is mentioned in the Ghostbusters uh, thing, the Tobin Spirit Guide. Is uh, it mentions Anik? I also used to. Ha- I think I still have it. Um, Marvel brought out an RPG game years ago. Um, yeah, the Marvel role playing game. That's there's one for that. Most things have some sort of tabletop role playing aspect to it, and whatever there is, I'm sure you can find it. Mm-hmm. You know, and it's you know, there's ones I think for mafia, like sort of like your New York gangs. Vampire Hunters. That'd be pretty cool. You know... But Vampire the Masquerade is like a massively like well-respected, well-regarded uh, RPG that is... I mean, I, I don't even know how long that's been that's been gone. But there's like so many different books. You see, like if, you're, if you've got like Traveling Man or something like that, there'll be an entire section of just Vampire the Masquerade stuff. Mm. Because it's all like different eras of the, like the vampire, the uh, the vampire groups within that world. 
And there's also a wrestling one called Worldwide Wrestling. Yes, I'd love to play that. Uh, I've got a PDF of it. I can send it. I'll throw it over to you. But, yes, do, please. Uh, but yeah, whatever there is, there's something out there for you. If you don't, if you want to play TTRPGs, and for all of its faults, Roll20 is also a great place if you want to start. If you can't find a group locally to play it, there's likely someone on Roll20 who plays it. You know, it covers plenty of games. Um, and it will, they do cover, there's a lot of things covered in these sort of, in the in the RPG world. Um, and it's not... You find a lot of the times when a, when a rule book comes out, there'll be things for uh, like for going on the foundry for like, what is it, uh, virtual tabletop? But you find there's like rules for Roll20 where it's been like incorporated into to running on that system really well. Like mm. everything's linked to uh, linked in for it. Yeah. But yeah, just you know, don't be afraid to look out there for these other games. Um, you know, especially if you like the t- if you like playing role playing games, but you like orcs and elves and dwarves and just not my bag. You know, there's going to be something else for you, you know. But with that, um, I think we've waffled on quite enough about tabletop role-playing games. Just don't be afraid to look out there. If you think it's a thing, and you Google <laughs> at the end of the day. Yeah, chances are either there's an official one or someone's reskinned D&D for it. So <laughs> it's there. But... Um... Does what say we move into some new and shiny? I think that would be a splendid idea, Christopher. So my new and shiny, um, I would like to talk about the new Drop Fleet Commander two-player starter set. Now, Mm -hmm. this two-player starter set is using the new line of uh, grey plastic sprue uh, TT Combat, the TT Combat plastic, plastic, bleh, can't say it now, plastic sprues. So, multi piece sprues. This set's gonna, uh, is on pre order at the minute. Um, and the pre order starts, well, I think it says pre order October 18th, so it's a little bit of a wait. Um, two player starter set, £80 off TT Combat directly. Uh, it's going to give you everything that you need to start playing Drop Fleet Commander, if that's your bag. Um, and you get a uh, you get a new generation. It's a new generation of ships. Basically, it's moved on a little bit uh, from the original. Uh, you get the UCM ships, and you get the bio officers. I always struggle with that word. The box includes nine UCM <laughs> ships. 15 bio-officer uh, bio ships. You get the Drop Fleet Commander rulebook, Drop Fleet bases, dice, space station sheet, debris sheets, token sheets, and three fast play sheets. Uh, and you can, those, they also have with the construction guides as well. But yes, this is the new, uh, these are the new like multi piece sort of sprue plastic Drop Fleet ships. Um, which is obviously where it's gone. Very detailed as well. Mm. Very detailed. Very nice. Very nice models. I quite like the look of those. Looking, bo- looking those... at the, looking at the pictures of uh, like the UCM ships in there. Mm. In fact, I think the best one for me to to refer to would be the uh, the Biofissers, because yeah. I picked up the anomaly yes. uh, recently, and that's resin. I don't see much in the way of any change of detail in nope. these plastics. No, and that's they one thing they really do. Really beautifully, they're really beautifully modelled. A lot of detail on these plastics. Yeah, and it's say it's it's something that they've wanted to do for a long time uh, to move away from resin into grey plastic. Uh, sprues mm-hmm. um, and Drop Fleet Commander is going to be 
the first of this. Uh, don't quote me on this, and I think with Strike Team Commander, when that comes out, I think as well they're going to start doing it in this rather than start mm -hmm. with resin and move over to it. Um, but yeah, it's a good leap forward for them. Um, again, the models look beautiful. Um, and I do Definitely. think as well, what I prefer about grey plastic, especially with minis like that, they're lighter, they're a bit more durable, because obviously when you glue them, it's not as brittle. Um, mm. But yeah. Especially you using plastic glue as well. Plastic mm. glue will, like, it, it basically melts the, like, the pieces that you glue together yeah. to, like, a ridiculously good weld. And, and those things will not come apart. No, and you have to give it some force to do that. But, it's good to see it going that way, honestly. Um, but yeah, beautiful models. Um, the rules have only been slightly updated. Uh, the rules haven't changed too much. But again, the rule book um, will bring in new gameplay aspects of the game that they've kind of been bringing in slowly. So it's going to be good to see how that goes. Um, I still have, uh, I still have a two-player starter set. Uh, from when it was still Hawk Games that I've yet to... I bought it off a fella. I didn't buy it new. Um, they're all in grey plastic, so I need to get them together. But it's going to be it's gonna be a good to see where that goes. What about you, Chris? Anything taking your interest as of late? Um, well, I have the newest and shiniest thing. Um... I have the the Walking Dead All Out War Commonwealth expansion. Nice. Uh, it just arrived through the post today. So just as well, I did have that early night yesterday because uh, I wouldn't have had this in my hands at the time of recording then. So it's um, it's the the last of the the Walking Dead uh, models. I, I do believe um, these are resin. Uh, it's the it's the end of the comic series, which is why I think this is just this is the end of it. It doesn't come with the, the like a rule book like the other uh, expansions have, uh, like um like uh, like a narrative uh, narrative play yeah uh, set of rules. Um, this is just purely it's. The, as you got as they got to the Commonwealth, uh, I, I I don't even think it went on too long. Um, wasn't a whole lot of uh, a whole lot of adventures to take place in the Commonwealth. But uh, this is where someone points out that I'm completely wrong because I dropped off uh, Walking Dead around about the time of the Commonwealth. But. Uh, Great resin models. A um, couple of named characters in there, and then a few of your like your minion type, where it's just like your uh, your Commonwealth uh, troopers, uh, heavily armored, heavily armed. Nice rules for the uh, for some like cohesion between uh, between the troopers and the uh, the named characters, so they can kind of like. Uh, the the Commonwealth Governor, if she's got uh, someone taking a shot at her and she's got some of the Commonwealth troopers uh, around her in her kill zone, they can take the uh, they can take the hit. So you've uh, you've got like these these basically chaff just to, to kind of get in the way of uh, the some bullets. Uh, it's always very good. Uh, there's other characters within the game who. Have rules like that, um, but it's uh, it's nice to bring them in. Uh, plenty of equipment cards, uh, character cards in there, and there's also some teamwork cards, which is a pretty new, a pretty new feature. Uh, as well as faction event cards, uh, there's, uh, there's ones that. Are, I say cards, card. Uh, there's one where 
if uh, if everyone who's playing agrees, you can stick this in with the the event cards, and it uh, it grants some uh, pretty nice bonuses against walkers uh, for the the Commonwealth. Uh, it doesn't get used against uh, against players, so it's like kind of if everyone agrees to having it in, it's not going to be a disadvantage for them. So it's a uh, it's nice to. It's a nice way to work that, and teamwork ones again. If people have a, if everyone agrees to having them in, it grants some bonus, uh, some bonus rules and uh, abilities. If you've got specific uh, teams of people, which uh, adds uh, adds a nice little bit of uh, like like a refresh at uh, if you've been playing for a while, which uh, I quite like. There's there was a, a card expansion that came out a bit back which kind of brought things like that in as well so like narrative uh, narrative events cool um just to say it's a little it's not so much new new and shiny um i follow a company called um dice heads um and they sort of did that um zootropolis um game I told you about which is like the four on four different animal factions fighting uh mm. battle royale. Uh Zootropolis? Yes. Zootropolis um Battle Royale. Uh they've also they've recently just released uh, a load of STLs in the same sort of style with all like the anthropomorphic animals, uh fantasy football fantasy American football uh teams. So you could use that for uh, your Blood Bowl games, uh, proxy them in for other things, make up your own rules, uh, maybe use mm. Gridiron Hero rules, having a little throwback to our last episode about sport. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's just, again, because primarily I only sort of watch for news about games that I play, I'm not... It's not like we're going to be reporting on like, oh, this is what uh, this is what uh, Games Workshop are doing. It's like, oh, no, we don't. Unless it's something that we really play, you're not you're not really yeah. going to hear about it from us. Uh, but that's not why you're here. Um, we're coming to Kickstarter soon. There's a, a new version of the Alien RPG. Um, I didn't put it in with when we're talking about Alien. Uh, because it's not, it's not really a new edition. Um, it's more of a rules clarification, and the cinematic campaign that it's bringing in. Uh, it's like a, a new starter set, uh, essentially they're bringing out. It's backwards compatible with the current books, but the current books are forward compatible with this new set of like rule clarifications that's coming. Uh, that's going to kickstart us soon. They've, uh, they've been advertising that. Plus, there's going to be miniatures, so that's a dangerous thing to put towards me. <laughs> <laughs> Official alien miniatures, considering the ma- how much you buy the knockoff stuff. You... Not knockoff. Inspired by. Inspired by, yeah. But uh, we'll see how that goes, and I'm. You know, I think someone close to you will have to be informed of this information because I worry that you're just going to get a house full of them. <laughs> I dare, like, if I had more room, I would have got the Hatchet Part Works uh, magazine for get like for building an, an alien. I think it's about a meter, two meters tall, maybe a meter, um, and it has like a like a motorized retractable the the like inner inner mm. jaw. If I had room for that, I would have I would have subscribed to that. <laughs> and I would have a xenomorph in the house. <laughs> but I don't have room for it, so I avoided it. I'm getting better with my spend. Um, I have some I have some disgust and speculation. Disgusting <laughs> speculation. <laughs> so disgusting. 
So uh, the Knight of Darkness, uh, Ace of Hearts, and maybe the Sir Flex style Crowd Knight uh, for Rumble Slam, I think will be the end of this month. Yeah. Now I've yes, I say uh, I, I sound surprised. Uh, no, it is. I genuinely don't know. Um, but I wouldn't be surprised yet if it was the end of this month that they're going to be going out. Um, mm-hmm. um, end of the month is Rumble Slam pre-order time. Mm. So historically, yeah, with it's always them been the teasing, end of with them teasing a bunch of stuff for the keep. I reckon we're getting these this month. So, um, I don't know about the the Goblin Manager or the uh, is it a, the Halfling Buffy the Vampire Slayer or that mystery one that they had peeking around the corner. I'm not sure about them. Or Lady Dimitrescu inspired. Mm. Now, I a part of me thinks that the Sir Flex sort of style crowd model that was in there that hold was holding up the shield. Mm. It's holding the shield, yeah. A part of me wants to think that that might be a usable, playable character. Maybe that is completely speculative. I don't, I don't know this. Um, but I think you know maybe like some sort of like super fan. But then it could just be a thematic crowd member for the S- keep. It just seems. It seems some, too specific. A kind of. Kind of like how uh, Gamora's got some of the like the entertainer and things like that that affect crowd pleasers. Yeah, I just feel them having a casino specific crowd member just seems a little bit too mm. teams too specific. Like I feel it will be a usable, playable model. I just feel that would be a... Mm. Because all the other crowd models that they've done for Rumble Slam and Half Tilt have all been very generic. Mm. You know, they've not... But this one feels like... You look at that one and you go, okay, yeah, he's from he's going to be in the keep. So I just feel it's too specific to be just a crowd model. You know? It's just, again, it's just disgusting speculation. Unless... Unless they're going to be doing casino sets, may well be again half a half a dozen crowd models in a like in a casino style. Again, I wouldn't put it past them. Um, I don't know. I, it's, again, this is why it's disgusting speculation. Um, we're just guessing. Um, that's just my take on it. I, that's my that's Daz's hot take. That I feel it's just too specific for them to warrant it. I say that knowing their production site, <laughs> so I've been there. I've been to see how it's all made. So I don't think that that's something they would do. But I would also stand corrected. Um, either way, it's a model that would probably end up in my collection at some point. Mm-hmm. Um. Purely because I do like the keep as a whole faction. Um, not massive. I'm not massive on pieces of D8. I'm gonna be honest. I'm not a massive fan of that faction. I only really like the two. I'm not huge on. Uh, I'm not huge on the uh, on the keep. Um, I, I like doing a bit of uh, a bit of shining armor. Uh, I'm enjoying that, and I've been enjoying some vampires. But on the whole, I'm not, I'm not too fussed with the keep. And that's the great thing about Rumble Slam. That all the such different things about it. There's just so much variety in it. Mm-hmm. If you don't like one thing, you're gonna like something else. If anything, I'm coming round more to the Forest Soul. Yeah, fair enough. I quite like Moot Carlo. Feral Den as well. I, I think Feral Den. They were probably one that I never really cared too much about but I think that last lot of Feral Den miniatures of the team where it's like the uh, the, the berserkers and stuff yeah 
I read I really I really like their models. And that's it, and that's what I think's great about it. But um yeah. And Warmonger as well. I think that's a cool model. Well I say it's just that's that's disgusting speculation dealt with. Um new and shiny dabbled on. And uh yeah. Thanks for joining us on the Tippy Cast, and if you're listening on Spotify, be sure to follow us. And if you're listening to us on YouTube, why not drop us a like and subscribe? And weigh in with your thoughts on what we've mentioned, missed, or something for us to look at for the next episode in the comments below. And it's a goodbye from him. And it's a goodbye from me.